next in our series of interviews with candidates who have contested races in the May 15th primary. So I have Zach Mulholland with me, who is, uh, I guess, running against Mindy and Victor for an eWeb at large seat. And so welcome to the program. Mm -hmm. And I guess the first question I have for you is, where'd you come from? Um, you know, how'd you, how'd you get to here? Sure. I uh, grew up in California, uh, moved to Central Oregon. Where, where, whereabouts? Are you in Northern California or uh, Southern California? Bay Area, Bay Area through about middle school. Uh, okay. And then I moved to Sisters, Oregon, right across the pass. Went to high school uh -huh. over there. I okay. uh, went to community college over in Bend. And uh, then I moved here uh, for uh, university. And I went uh -huh. to the University of Oregon, earned degrees in physics and political science. Oh, physics. Uh, and, I'm impressed. Uh, been doing mostly political work ever since. Uh -huh. So. So a STEM subject, excellent. Yeah. So you're doing anything with uh, with the physics at all? You're doing political stuff. Well, my main focus is uh, around the issue of climate change and the political okay. sphere. So uh, you know, I think having that background and uh, both an understanding of the science and what needs to be done, uh, as well as some of the solutions that have been presented over the previous years, is uh, really valuable for the work that I do. So. Okay. So we'll come back to climate change because yeah. that's a topic near and dear to my heart. Um, Let's see. So, are you married? Family? You know, or, or uh, nope, not married. Not yeah. yet. Huh? Yeah. So, okay. Um, so, what what made you decide that, that you wanted to run for UWEB? Sure. Yeah. Well, uh, you know, I, I grew up hiking and camping out in the woods. Mm -hmm. uh, I got some really incredible experiences when I was younger to go out into nature and really connect. And, uh, you know, still to this day, uh, I, when, that's where I go to uh, get away and regenerate and, regenerate right. and uh, re re refuel my stores. And, uh, you know, I see how climate change is really starting to threaten the natural systems that we all care about and mm -hmm. that, you know, we want to be able to pass down to our, our kids and grandkids and future generations. Okay, well, that, and, that's uh, all good. But the question is, can we actually do anything about it today? Well, yeah, and I think eWeb is really well placed in order to make an impact on that issue. Yeah. It has a very green utility uh, that also happens to be long on power right now. They're overcontracted for more power than they need for their local customer base. Well, uh, they have I this mean, really they're green largely because they're in an area that has a fair amount of hydroelectric. If I could finish yeah, my, go ahead. my point. Uh, so as, as a fairly clean utility that has extra power, one right. of the big things that eWeb can do to reduce emissions is actually help the broader community transition off fossil fuels. So this is doing things like helping people transition from natural gas to high efficiency heat pumps and water heaters, mm -hmm. which can save folks money while we're also lowering emissions. Okay. And very similarly, eWeb should be uh, <clears throat> developing and implementing an electric vehicle action plan. So this is something that the two big utilities in the state, PGE and Pacific Power, okay. were required to do under a piece of 2016 legislation yeah. uh, referred to as the Coal to Clean Bill. Uh, or the RPS increase bill of 2016 uh, in the Oregon legislature. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> and so uh, eWeb basically working with the city and other community partners should be working to make it as easy as possible for the community, business owners, individuals to install electric vehicle charging stations, uh, putting in wiring along streets so that people that don't have electric uh, don't have driveways and garages can still get charging stations, trying to get EVs into student driver training programs so the next generation is learning on two new technology. So these are the types of things that we could include in a comprehensive EV action plan. Mm -hmm. uh, that, and it will also not only help the transition off of fossil fuels, but also uh, get eWeb you know, more customers and help their bottom line and make it so that we can uh, have cheap power for everyone. Okay, uh, cheap power for everyone. Well, uh, help cover some of those centralized costs by having more demand for electricity, okay. uh, rather than having people spending more on natural gas or gasoline powered vehicles. Spending more. Okay. Um, so eWeb actually is connected to the, to the larger grid mm -hmm. in the sense that we, when we have a surplus of power, put it back on the grid. And when we need power, we draw it from the rest of the system. Mm -hmm. um, so if we're if we're moving to uh, fuel electric cars, then um, or you know use more electricity, as it were, what we're doing is we're no longer able to pump some hydroelectric back into the the grid, so that we displace say coal or oil fired uh, plants or diesel diesel plants. So what's what's the impact of of actually expanding our operation based on the overall carbon output of the of the country. 
so, I mean, I think energy markets are complicated, and uh, just because uh, we don't buy renewable power doesn't mean that someone else automatically will. There's a lot of hydro that's being curtailed. People are, the PGE Pacific Power would often rather run their coal plants than purchase wind and hydropower right. uh, from other power providers because uh, they're actually making money by running their own facilities. Yeah. So <clears throat> I, I just, I want to say that it's a little bit more complicated than that. Uh, EWEB, you know, is over contracted significantly for power right now. They have about 60% more than they need for their local customer base. We're actually losing money on most of those contracts by selling that money back into the wholesale market yep. at a loss. Mm -hmm. uh, and so, you know, I think eWeb should be looking at kind of right sizing the utility more towards the local customer base, allowing other customers to buy up that hydropower, if, you know, especially if we're looking at a system in coming in the future years with the state legislature maybe putting a price on greenhouse gas emissions, that that hydropower will have a added value in the market, mm -hmm. uh, both BPA's power and the hydro that eWeb sells. Mm -hmm. yep. uh, there was a, a report that eWeb was a, a, one of the funders of that came out, uh, they presented in January, <coughs> basically saying that a cap and invest program is the cheapest way for them to reduce emissions statewide. Right. And not only that, because BPA were a preferred power customer, uh, if they're selling more hydropower to PGE Pacific Power, mm -hmm. that that's actually going to help them lower and subsidize our rates. Um, somewhat complicated <laughs> answer to a simple question. Uh, main point being is that wind and solar are getting cheaper all the time. And, uh, well, is wind, is wind power a useful one in this particular area? Yeah, I mean, absolutely. I think now, that if you're... So the, Eugene has an average wind speed of six miles per hour throughout the, throughout the area. You really can't do wind until you've got at least 10, 12... You know, you, and most people won't even begin to do the, uh, won't even begin to try to justify okay. the economics until you've got uh, uh, 15, because the energy contained in wind goes up by velocity cubed. Well, I, I'm of course speaking yeah. of regional mm -hmm. markets, okay. and uh, there's a lot of wind power out there. There's a lot of hydropower out there. It doesn't all need to be here, though. We mm -hmm. should be looking at how we can get more locally sourced things as well. Yeah, and and Eugene also suffers from a lot of cloudiness. You know, in terms of, I did, I, I've been doing a talk over the last few years, um, and I've done it to, say, permaculture communities and stuff like that. Uh, and the first two slides on it, the first one is um, a picture of someone pushing a car. And the question is, okay, there's a gallon of gasoline that will drive your car, depending on the nature of the car, you know, 20, 30, 40, 60 miles. How long would it take you to push that car the same distance that the gallon of gasoline will um, will drive it? I mean, what, what, what is the point that you're trying the to make? The point is that it's very concentrated, okay? Mm -hmm. So the answer to the question is it'll take you about uh, 320, 330 hours, mm -hmm. okay? Because a human being can, can produce about a kilowatt, mm -hmm. uh, uh, about 100 watts, right? okay? And so um, I mean, we, we saw Tesla just release their big electric semi where they would be able to get 500 miles on a single charge. And they're talking about being able to recharge that in less than an hour. So I think the technology is changing. It, and we need to be aware of that. The technology so. is. Um, but the second slide on that is how big a solar collector at the current sort of 20 percent efficiency mm -hmm. uh, cells, which there are physical limitations um, to that efficiency. In other words, for, for monocrystal and silicon, we're right. not going to see an improvement. Um, or a significant improvement because of physical concerns. You'll have to go to multiple layers, and that's very expensive. But um, uh, how big a, an array would you have to have to replace that one gallon of gasoline every day, uh, given the average weather? You know, so you have in December low, low in the sky sun and a fair amount of cloudiness. So how big would that array have to be to replace that one gallon of gasoline? And the answer to that one is about, about 10,000 square feet, so about 100 by 100. Mm -hmm. yeah. So the question comes down, you know, even though the, the price of solar cells mm -hmm. has dropped enormously and largely because the Chinese are manufacturing them in these highly automated factories, um, it's still a very diffuse form of energy. Um, so it, the question is, could we, could we really, in, say, a place like Oregon, go to um, uh, an all-renewable uh, base 
with, you know, with the technologies, mm -hmm. or are there better ways to deal with load management? Right. Well, I mean, I think it's a, a multifaceted issue, and part of the answer uh -huh. is energy efficiency. Part of the answer is using less, yep. and part of the answer is electrification and storage. Uh, right. And so, so, so you've hit you've hit on three of the four points that you have to deal with. The other one is transporting it as energy, mm -hmm. in the sense that, you know, if you're talking about transmission lines or you know tankers on a highway, you know, moving the energy or however it is, whether you you know, heat up, say, globber salts and haul it from a, you know, building to building or something, mm -hmm. you always have to transport your energy to where it's going to be used. Right. So there's four factors That's that where, have to be you know, a, a high voltage DC national grid could be very beneficial if we're able to connect down with California, mm -hmm. get their excess solar during the day. At other times of the year, we can take wind from <clears throat> the northwest and mm -hmm. send that down south. Yep. Uh, same with our hydropower. We, a lot of times we have more hydropower than we need. Sometimes we need power from down south. So, uh, you know, I think the more that we can connect energy markets is one, you know, additional way to, uh, to deal with that issue. Yeah. Uh, but I think we're seeing a lot of emerging technologies. Here in Oregon, we actually produce more hydropower than we use power in the state, but we sell that hydro down to California and then we purchase so, coal from other states, which is an unfortunate So give dynamic. me an example of an emerging technology. <clears throat> Well, I think EVs, uh, you know, the, 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 the uh, new semis that are coming on the market, I think every year we hear about new developments uh, with new battery and uh, energy storage technologies uh, coming out of the Department of Energy and other places. So. But the question is, I mean, say, say we took, you know, um, ener you can do energy per volume or you can do energy per, per mass, in mm -hmm. other words, the right. weight of the, of the cells. Mm -hmm. Aren't we starting to bump up against the physical limitations at this point in terms of chemistry-based storage um, in the lithium, for example, the uh, phos um, oxidized phosphate uh, batteries? Aren't we starting to, to move up against the chemical uh, limit to how much we can store in, in batteries? So I'm, I'm sort of wondering about whether we're going to see, you know, we've battery battery technology you know the lithium ion batteries have mm -hmm. been around for a while what we're seeing is mostly manufacturing uh, mass production in automated uh, facilities to produce these things mm -hmm. which is bringing the cost down but are we likely to see um, say a new innovation that makes a more a significantly more efficient battery yeah. well I mean you know, I think they're already actually coming online if you look at the development it's actually a lot of it's being developed around uh, autonomous uh, vehicles well, uh, flying yeah. vehicles uh, and so the desire to but that's not changing the battery technology no I mean it's it's actually creating a market for these very uh, energy dense materials mm -hmm. so people yeah. that want to fly planes with elect using electricity and people that want to fly uh, small autonomous vehicles mm -hmm. using electricity. Yeah. Uh, they're investing a lot in this space to make it so that they can have the energy density that they need in order to serve this market. And so I think that's going to be creating a lot of new uh, dynamics in, in the sector where there's new products coming online. And plus there's also uh, you know new materials that are being developed uh, to make it so that we can uh, increase efficiencies and also move away from uh, certain uh, chemicals or uh, substances where there would be a limited supply and we're going to be bumping up into a limited supply. So, so I, I guess what, I, I guess what <clears throat> I'm, I'm, I'm looking at is, um, as, a, as a physics major, I'm wondering what the, the sense of a theoretic energy density that we could, uh, um, that we could achieve out of, a, out of a physical, you know, a battery, a chemical system. Um, how much more room do we have in terms of that development? Uh, or are we reaching the, the sort of limits in terms of this? And what we're really looking at is um, commercialization as the issue. Well, I mean, I think that there are yeah. new processes that have been yeah. developed that have not yet reached commercialization. And so okay. we're still waiting on some of those things. Mm -hmm. But at the same time, there are products being commercialized right now that have the energy density that we need mm -hmm. to fly people through the air. The, okay. one of the most energy intensive things that you can do. So the fact that we're already getting there, mm -hmm. uh, it tells me that the, the horizons are bright and there's a nice future there. Uh, I think if we look at what's happened with 
solar panels, with wind turbines, mm -hmm. and is now happening with batteries. The, the cost drops are astounding, and, uh, and they're following the same types of uh, curves that happened okay. with semiconductor device manufacturing for semiconductor chips for computers. Uh, the fact that you have you know, in your cell phone, in your pocket, as much power as a room full of computers you know, 60 years ago, mm -hmm. yeah. uh, this is the power of the market and demand and changing demand uh, dynamics around new technology. Right. The computer thing was, <coughs> was driven basically by photolithography, the ability to cut a smaller hole in the surface of a piece of silicon. Mm -hmm. I mean, if you're talking about, say, 14 nanometer um, you know, processing for, say, Intel processors or something like that, you're really dealing with something that's 140, a hole that's 140 atoms wide. Mm -hmm. And to be able to reliably uh, do that. As you start getting down in, you know, into the 80, you know, which would be 8 nanometers or 50, or, or 50 atoms across 5 nanometers, um, you're really going to begin to see the impact of quantum effects, things like tunneling mm -hmm. and that yeah. sort of thing, which I, is going to reduce the, the reliability. The point I was making is that the uh, cost per computation yeah, uh, gone has gone down Absolutely. astronomically, as have the costs of all of these emerging right. energy technologies. And unlike a fuel like uh, you know, oil and coal and gas, where you know, ostensibly they're going to run out eventually, you, know, you have issues with you know, resources for these other devices as well. Yeah. But in terms of market of scale, markets of scale and being able to, to grow and bring costs down significantly, we're still in this phase of the market where the costs are still coming down, yeah. and we haven't really realized the full potential benefits of mm -hmm. uh, these new technologies. So. But is that? But let's say you get elected to <coughs> EWEB. Um, if we're talking about future developments, is that something that we have the ability to invest in today? Because essentially, as a utility sitting in Oregon, um, we're kind of stuck with off-the-shelf technologies as they currently exist. Right. Well, I think that. Uh, as I said, the, the two main pieces, you know, Eugene's greenhouse gas emissions uh, within the city is uh, almost 40% from natural gas and about 50% okay. from transportation, right. with a very small percentage coming from electricity and a small percentage coming from our waste stream, so methane off of our landfill and off of our wastewater treatment plant. Yep. So, you know, when you're talking about going after those two big buckets of emissions, right. these are both places where if eWeb can displace natural gas use or uh, gasoline use, mm -hmm. we are bringing people onto the grid and increasing our customer base. We are lowering emissions, mm -hmm. and these are both technologies where we're able to get people into either EVs or high efficiency heat pumps and water heaters, where it's actually going to be cheaper for them to run on a day to day basis yeah. than their current systems. Yeah. Right. So this is a win 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 for the utility, for customers, and for the planet. And you know, I think that that's a good deal for consumers and for the general public. So. Okay. Well, we are starting to see some electric vehicles come in to the marketplace. Mm -hmm. um, that was sort of delayed for a long time, and there is some question as to why it was delayed. Mm -hmm. You've probably seen the uh, documentary, Who yeah. Killed the Electric Car? Mm -hmm. um, <coughs> so, yeah, it was a, an issue of delaying this, this thing, but it, it, is, it is coming around. So making charging stations available is a, is a good thing, but one of the things that, that I read recently was a report on actual utilization of a lot of these stations mm, that have been yeah. put around, and we find that the utilization is, is quite low. Now, the argument is made if you make the stations available, people will buy the cars, um, is, you know, but we don't seem to be seeing that happen. Mm -hmm. So I'm, I'm sort of wondering uh, about the optimism there. I mean, maybe you're right, um, but the historic data thus far doesn't seem to indicate that, that there's going to be a, a rush to this, mm -hmm. especially with the huge premium that's, that's placed on electric vehicles um, by the manufacturers at the right. moment. Um, so a few things. So, you know, one is, uh, you know, thank goodness for Tesla uh, for making electric cars uh, Sexy, I guess yeah. would be the right word. Okay. Uh, you know, it's something where, you know, them getting out into the space and making it something that this is, it's the new smartphone. It's the new thing that, it's going to be the new, right. and having all of the other car companies chasing after that space now is actually right. extremely valuable. And, mm -hmm. you know, that, you know, along with things like 
uh, France and India and China talking about fully phasing out internal combustion engines and no longer selling them in the next 12 years. Uh, so, you know, that's, <clears throat> that's one piece. Uh, you know, a, a second is that eWeb should be taking a multifaceted approach. So, like I said, I think that they should be developing a, a comprehensive EV action plan that right. sh could include things like, uh, you know, subsidizing electric vehicle charging stations or just trying to ha have a, the a, a high levels of education for individual customers and business customers that are wanting to install those for their, uh, for their employees or for their homes. Um, <clears throat> you know, the other thing is, you know, you mentioned the high upfront cost of electric vehicles. So yeah. this is actually one of the things that, you know, eWeb can really help with. You know, if eWeb is going to, uh, if you're getting onto an electric vehicle and you're going to be yeah. buying more power from eWeb, mm -hmm. That's one way for eWeb to recoup costs of, say, some incentives to get into an electric vehicle. Uh, very similarly, uh, eWeb can offer low, in, uh, low interest loans. Yeah. Uh, eWeb can be a partner for helping people uh, get property assessed clean energy loans where they can pay back the loans through their power bill, mm -hmm. uh, or sorry, through their uh, property taxes. So eWeb can be a, a facilitator helping others move in the direction that you know, we, I think, all as a community think that we need to move. So. Well, uh, you know, I, I sort of, the point is I, I agree with you. I think that we have to make these particular transitions. My question is uh, whether the political will to do that is, is there. Um, but in terms of financing and the like, I mean, eWeb and, and SUB both have gotten involved in uh, financing reduction in use because it, it's cheaper to save um, a kilowatt hour than to mm -hmm. create the capacity to produce that kilowatt hour. Well, I think you, you'll actually see EWEB's pulled back from doing that as much as they used to, uh, basically because they don't want to eat into their own demand, and that's an uh, unfortunate thing where they've gotten themselves into a situation where you know, they're so overextended on power that any reduction in demand really you know, mm -hmm. hits the bottom line. And so right. you know, there is a hope that, that we can get out of that dynamic. Uh, you know, and, and absolutely, it would be great if we can, you know, keep our use as flat as possible. Yeah. Uh, and even as we're hopefully adding in, you know, EVs and people switching off of natural gas, that we can actually uh, hopefully not, you know, expand our usage, but keep it, you know, in yeah. line. Okay. Because, yeah, so, yeah, it is the question of whether you're building more demand through this, through this, for electricity, through this um, particular practice, or you're... Um, you're building building capacity, so there, there's yeah, there's a quite there's a question there. Okay, um, so let's see, let's let's go all the way back to climate change because I wanted to to come in on that. Um, there's there's a lot of folks, and it's fairly popular to say, okay, if we get our carbon emissions down, we can save the planet. Mm -hmm. Okay, um, is that really possible? This this sort of save the planet thing. Or are we already doomed to pop to a hotter temperature state? Well, I mean, temperatures have already gone up by about one degree Celsius. With well, the Berkeley climate study would indicate that since 1750, it's gone up by two degrees. Okay, well, since the, the mid-1850s, which I think is what most people go back to, which is the start of the Industrial Revolution yeah. when we really started burning coal and oil and gas in a big way. Uh, <clears throat> that, that it's about a 1C temperature increase. Okay. Uh, with the amount of greenhouse gases that are already in the atmosphere, if we stopped burning today, the amount that's already up there would get us about, about to one in a degree and a half Celsius temperature increase. Uh, scientists say, you know, beyond two is really, really bad. Many scientists are saying, actually, what we're already seeing is really, really bad. And we see you the know. bleaching of the coral reefs. Uh, we see the well, increase well, in well, wildfires. We well, see those, the, those, are, those are sort of secondary changes. The, the big the big changes that are going to, well, there's four factors that set the surface temperature of the planet. The output of the sun, which is relatively constant, mm -hmm. and certainly averaged over a period of time, it's constant, which the systems are large enough to do that. The second is the distance from the sun. So mm -hmm. we do have the molecular cycle because our orbit does become more right. or less elliptic. Uh, the third is the surface absorption of the planet, um, which is affected by... Uh, ice coverage. Uh, ice things. coverage is the huge one, yes. Mm -hmm. And then the final one is the uh, how effectively the planet re-radiates infrared back into space mm -hmm. to balance the incoming radiation from the sun to the outgoing uh, 
uh, radiation. Right. But the big one is the reflectivity, and that's due, that is changing at this point quite rapidly. I mean, the Arctic yeah. um, has, uh, over my lifetime from the 1950s, okay, has, has dropped from more than 10 feet average thickness to less than three. Mm -hmm. And is likely to be ice free uh, for a few September days. In yeah. when I say ice free, it'll go all the way from the Bering Strait to the North Pole, and there'll probably be a pile, a triangle of ice sitting on the northern coast of Greenland, where the currents, um, you know, sort of mm -hmm. go around the yeah. go around Greenland. But it'll be ice free like that um, for a few September days. You know, as early as 2020, um, possibly. Uh, as late as maybe 2025, worst case, but probably in the 2020 yeah. to 2022 range. Now, the uh, yearly uh, ice-free, or year-round ice-free, could be as early as 2030, and that's mm -hmm. where we start to significantly change the surface absorption of the planet, because during the four, averaged over the, the four summer months, um, you know, called June, July, August, September, uh, or July, August, September, October, that window, uh, the Arctic shows between 3 and 4 percent of the face of the planet mm -hmm. uh, to the sun, which is quite significant when you change it from reflecting 85 percent of the sunlight that hits it to absorbing, you know, anywhere from half to three quarters right. um, of that sunlight. That's an enormous change. Uh, it uh, pencils out to almost another petawatt. So that's, that's where the question comes. Can't, even if we reduce our carbon mm -hmm. uh, stuff, do we right. still have time to actually do anything about right. it? And so, you know, what you're referring to, uh, the polar ice melting, is, you know, one of many potential negative feedback loops where... Well, it's not negative, it's a positive feedback loop, but yeah. Uh, okay, so yeah, a, a, a feedback loop where by warming causes something to happen that, that yeah, then causes it, further warming further to happen. So you mentioned the, the ice melting. There's also uh, methane, methane hydrates, which is methane ice at the bottom of the ocean. If that gets released, methane is a power, power, very powerful greenhouse gas. If that ice yep. melts and bubbles up into the atmosphere, uh, we have a lot of methane and CO2 being released from permafrost that's melting. Uh, yep. Both, you know, north of us, but also, you know, in Russia. I, I think that's uh, that's all very so, true. But well, it's, if I the, could, yeah. The, the, the question is, right? Okay. It, can we avert, okay, going to a hotter temperature state? Because now what we've got is a series of positive feedback right. loops. If you go, for example, to Guy McPherson's web page, he's got listed more than 50 right. positive feedback loops that are still being that are being studied. Yeah, go ahead. Right. So if I, I could yeah, finish where ahead. I was going with that, is that there are these negative feedback loops. Uh, some of the best climate scientists in the world, so uh, James Hansen being one of them, uh, talks about basically if we get beyond really even one and a half degrees Celsius, these feedback loops are going to start hitting and we might see runaway warming where we can't, you know, we can't put the genie back in the bottle. Yeah. Uh, so, you know, that speaks to the fact that we really need to get behind, you know, so, so Eugene has adopted science-based greenhouse gas reduction targets that are in line with staying below one and a half degrees Celsius and returning to one C yeah. temperature increase by the end of the century. And it just shows the urgency of reducing our ambitions in line with those goals. And part of those goals include a sequestration component where we're not only reducing our emissions that we're putting up into the air, but we're actually actively trying to take emissions back out of the atmosphere. And so this can be done through better forest practices, okay. uh, through sequestering carbon in soils. And one of the things I think we're going to see in the uh, start to develop is sequestration through industrial means. Uh, they're already doing this uh, in Europe at a facility where they're using renewable energy to uh, capture CO2 from the atmosphere using a chemical process and then they're pumping that CO2 underground and it's uh, being mineralized and being sequestered for the long term. So, uh, you know, if you look at the scale of, you know, the emissions that we're putting into the atmosphere, about 40 billion tons of CO2 each year, mm -hmm. uh, and the curves necessary to come down to avoid the, the negative feedback loops that we're talking about, you know, it speaks to the necessity to you know absolutely move forward with reducing as fast as we can and that we're also going to need to sequester a whole bunch of stuff if we're going to want to avoid 
you know, some of the uh, worst case scenarios that we're looking at, you know, we're already seeing our, uh, uh, you know, I said mentioned coral reefs bleaching, but we're also seeing issues with our oysters on the coast where they're not able mm -hmm. to, uh, the baby oysters aren't able to form their shells properly because the ocean is now more acidic than it used to be because it's absor absorbing carbon from the atmosphere and it's term turning into carbonic acid in the ocean. So, you know, we're looking at some very, very serious issues uh, if we don't get this thing under control. Uh, and I'm you know, I'm in agreement with that, you completely. That, that's and why I, could, I think I it's absolutely critical. Eweb yeah. works on this and is a yeah. leading player working to help the city transition off fossil fuels as the city goes to update its climate action plan in the coming months. Cool. Eweb should be a leading player, saying this is this is what we're willing to do to move the ball forward. And uh, as an Eweb commissioner, I'll be pushing Eweb in that direction to be make Eweb one of the leading utilities helping with vehicle electrification and help people transition off natural gas because that's what we need to do for our kids and our grandkids. Okay. Yeah, <laughs> even though I don't have kids yet. Yeah, the, okay, so you're, you are optimistic that we can avoid um, transition to a hotter temperature state. I mean, over the past five million years, we've been bouncing from interglacials to um, ice ages to interglacial ice age to interglacial to ice age. Um, the amount of carbon dioxide we have in the atmosphere pulls us off that cycle. In other words, there's at, at 400 mm -hmm. plus parts per million with an equivalent, equivalent rise in methane. Mm -hmm. it puts us about 490 CO2 equivalent, uh, according to uh, <clears throat> NOAA. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So the thing is that um, uh, with that particular background, um, can we get back? down uh, Hansen and most of like Bill McKibben and the whole 350.org mm -hmm. thing is, is saying we got to get back down below 350. Mm -hmm. My question is let's assume that we successfully do that, right. which I have grave doubts, but let's assume mm -hmm. that we successfully do that. If the Arctic was melting during the 1960s at 320 parts per million, will get, getting to 350 actually do anything meaningful? I mean, I think there are, there are important questions there. You know, if the Arctic has melted, you know, that will create these new, new dynamics within that system. Yep. And if, you know, will, will restoring CO2 to more historical levels, so 350 goes for 350, you know, 280 parts per million is the, the more historic pre-industrial average. Yep. And, you know, there's this question mark of, you know, if you return to where things were before, uh, how quickly will the system return to that equilibrium or, 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 will, it or, even, or will it or even will return? it or will it return to that new yes. equilibrium um, you know my my take is is that uh, we see these changes coming mm -hmm. um, we can accept them uh, and say let's deal with the consequences right. we can say let's try and stop the consequences as much as we can, we can yeah. do both, which is probably what we should be doing is planning for the worst, but also doing what as much as we can to stop okay. the worst from happening. Yeah. Uh, and so, you know, can we stop it? I don't know. You know, I, I think we can if you follow the science that, that hopefully we can uh, figure out what we need to do fast enough yeah. so that we can actually get ahead of this thing. And like I said, mm -hmm. start actively removing CO2 from the atmosphere as well, because it's not just about making things less bad. It's about turning this thing around and making it so that we actually have a climate system that is stable and works for, you know, works for the large majority of people on the planet the way it has worked for, you know, human history. So, yeah. Okay. So, um, okay. So you think that we can, you are actually maintaining that we can turn it around at this point, that we still have the ability to do I, that. I think if we take drastic actions within the next five years to really reduce our emissions in a big way, that we can get on the right trajectory. And if Eugene uh, shows others how to do it, that others are looking for ways yeah. to address these issues and we can have a big impact on that. So. Okay, so you believe that. Um, okay, good. So you've talked about, you've mentioned things like heat pumps. So let's, let's mm -hmm. give the audience a little bit of an education on heat pumps. Why is a heat pump preferable to a furnace? Uh, my understanding is that uh, the physical process by which you are uh, transferring heat from one place to another, so usually underground to into your house or vice versa if you're trying to cool your house, is a more efficient 
uh, thermodynamic process than uh, generating heat from electricity. So that's my understanding of how the, the, those di of those dynamics. Yes, the electricity is a very very high quality form of energy that you can use to. Um, a, lo a lot of energy work looks at the the equivalent temperature of what you could produce based on the fuel that you're working with. Mm -hmm. For example, hydrocarbon in open in an open air flame can maybe hit you know. 14, 1500 degrees, but you have to be pumping oxygen in, in other words, the blast furnace effect, mm -hmm. mellows, or something like that in order to achieve higher temperatures. Mm -hmm. So electricity, I mean, you could, you could achieve temperatures, you know, of many thousands of degrees very easily directly. Um, it's capable of producing those kinds of things, so it's a very high quality fuel. Um, the question would be, do we want to for example, we're using a lot of electricity to heat homes mm -hmm. simply because uh, of natural the gas to heat homes as well. Exactly, it, because it is um, uh, easy to install. In other words, electric baseboard heating is really cheap to install in homes. Mm -hmm. And so if you're building a, an, a, an affordable house, okay, you're likely, it's likely to be heated with electricity, although you're going to pay a lot more for that heating. Now, heat pumps are an improvement. Mm -hmm. Okay, but that still sort of ignores the larger question of sh how much heat should you be, or cooling should you be needing to, you know, do in a house um, actively because you failed to, you know, insulate it adequately or build it in a manner that it needs less. Mm -hmm. So, you know, in the United States we have very few, you know, net zero energy buildings, right. whereas in Europe, we see a lot of them because they have taken the time to require those kinds of systems that produce um, your net zero effects. So how would, how would we go about doing this? So heat pumps are one way to do it, but are there, are there more cost-effective means to achieve that? To achieve energy efficiency or? Uh, or just p the heating. You know, it's right. a question of whether you're making yeah. a first law so, decision or a second law decision. You know, a few, a few things. So one is that uh, the governor signed an executive order that we're going to be updating the state's building codes so that by 2030 all new construction is going to be uh, net zero ready, which means that if you were to install solar panels, it would be net zero household. Right. Okay. Uh, so that's one step in the dire right direction in terms mm -hmm. of standards for homes and making them more efficient and yep. like you mentioned, uh, making sure that they're well insulated. Mm -hmm. uh, I think that uh, getting folks to you know, be educated about uh, high efficiency heat pumps is, is one important thing. You mm -hmm. providing incentives to help with the, maybe the higher upfront cost. Right. Uh, where you know you're, you're switching folks hopefully to electricity and that that can be recouped over time while saving folks money I think is a, a, an important issue. Uh, I also <clears throat> think that you know, this is a little bit uh, it's related but uh, basically um, there's this uh, policy called a home energy score policy mm -hmm. uh, that would make it so that whenever a home is listed for rent or for sale it would have the expected energy use yep. of that home mm -hmm. would also get listed so this is a policy that uh, as a sustainability commissioner, I chaired a committee where I drafted this po uh, a policy proposal to council. Uh, council has passed a work session on it. They're getting ready to have a work session where they're going to hopefully implement this policy where when you go to buy or rent a home, you're actually going to know what the energy costs are before you move in. Yeah. And so this is something where, you know, uh, about half of the homes in Eugene are actually rentals uh, yeah. rather than ho owner occupied. Uh, and this is something where uh, a home energy score can actually both help owners when they're buying a house, but also uh, renters. Because right now when you go to rent a house, you actually have no idea what the expected energy costs are going to be. Yep. Uh, you know what the rent is, uh, but you don't really know how good is the insulation, uh, how much are the baseboard heaters going to cost versus maybe a more efficient method. And this is one way where we can have this information put into the market at a really opportune time where you can say, well, well I'm, this I'm, place is this expensive, but, and the power is 50 bucks, and this place is, uh, you know, looks cheaper on paper, but the power bill is 150 bucks a month, and therefore I know that I can go to the cheaper place and I can make that decision. Right. And that creates an incentive for the landlords then to say, well, if I can charge 50 bucks more a month by lowering the power bill 100 bucks a month, that's a good investment for them now because now they can actually monetize that, show it to their to the people that are going to be renting, and uh, basically it's a, it's it's a 
a push, a push in the right direction for them to do what they should be doing already, which is providing energy efficient homes for you know the people that, yeah. that live with them. And then you know for homeowners as well, this can be really valuable because it makes it so that when you buy a home and you have this report that says, well, if you do this, this, and this, mm -hmm. it can save you this much money each month. Well, now you can actually roll those improvements into your new home loan and yeah. have them pay for themselves uh, through the loan so that mm -hmm. you'll actually be paying lo less in total monthly costs when you combine the slightly increased uh, mortgage payments with the much lower energy bills. And so you know, I think that there's a lot of little things that we can do to kind of nudge the market in the right direction. Uh, you know, eWeb could actually use these scores as a tool to determine where uh, people are most in need of energy efficiency improvements and use it as a way to direct incentives to where it can be most valuable. Uh, and so you know, I think that there's a lot of uh, you know, different pieces. There's, the, like I said, the statewide energy efficiency standards. There's what eWeb can do with incentives to help uh, deal with the high upfront costs uh, associated with some of these new technologies that then are cheaper over the lifetime of the product. Mm -hmm. uh, and there's also things that you know, the city can do with home energy scores to make it so that uh, everyone knows what their expected energy costs are going to be before they move in and that they can make decisions accordingly. Okay. Um, I think it's a good, good practice. I remember pushing those ideas in the late 1970s. Okay. We're, we're, we've, we've moved on a bit since mm -hmm. then. And so now we're still talking about pushing them. And maybe this time they'll actually get implemented. Mm -hmm. And if you are able to do that, my hat's off to you. Um, you probably we're find it close. We're almost there. What's that? We're we're pretty we're 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 pretty close. It's it's, ge it's getting there, but um, I still I still remain with the question of can we reverse the trend in climate change? And I I mean you you mentioned the book Drawdown, and that's what that book is entirely about: is how can we. Uh, not only reduce our emissions, but begin to draw down emissions from the atmosphere so that we can start to turn this thing around. So, I mean, I think that's what our goal should be, is to get not only to net zero emissions, but net negative emissions so that we're actively taking it, uh, doing drawdown and taking okay. CO2 and, out of and the And that, air. see, the whole thing about this is it's a lot of people making individual choices. Well, and that's why systems approaches are really important. Right. That's why. But even, even if we do eWeb, okay, mm -hmm. eWeb is, is one city in Oregon, in the United States, you know, in the planet. And it presupposes that everybody else is going to make the same um, level of honest effort to deal with this. Mm -hmm. What do you think the chances are that that's going to happen? I think there are a lot of really engaged people all over the earth that really want to deal with this issue. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, not just here, but in countries all over the world, from you know Bangladesh to uh, you know remote island nations, right. and <clears throat> you know it's all about everyone stepping up and doing their part, right? And you know, if you give to a political campaign, you know your your ten bucks, you know, doesn't mean a whole lot, but you put that together with a thousand other people, and all of a sudden it's a campaign, right? Yeah. And you know, very similarly with climate change. If you want to deal this, with this issue, you got to do your part. You can't just say, well, it's all on everybody else. I shouldn't have to do anything, right? And, you know, and so there's also the piece that people are looking for leaders. If Eugene figures this out, Portland will copy us, all right? And if Portland does it, you know, co well, East Coast cities will copy that, Portland. And so it's, you know, a, it's this thing of, thing. If you, well, I mean, there's this, this famous, you know, Obama line about the, the woman that came to one of the meetings and said, you know, are you fired up, fired up, ready to go, ready to go? And they got the whole room, you know, lifted up, yeah. right? And there's this saying of, you know, if you can change a room, you know, if you, if you can change a room, then you can change a city. If you can change a city, you can change a state. If you can change a state, you can change the nation. If you can change the nation, you can change the world, right? And so I believe, I believe in that. I believe that individuals, by putting forward good ideas and working with their community partners to get them implemented, can make a change in their community and that other people all around the world that also want to make change in their communities will pick that up and run with it because humans are really good at copying other people's good ideas you know good ideas maybe they don't come right maybe everybody doesn't have a good idea all the time but you know if we see someone else doing something that looks like a good idea and they're being successful at it we're really good at saying hey you know i think we should do that too so uh, like the home energy score policy. Portland has done it for their new home sales, and now mm -hmm. you, we're saying in Eugene, hey, let's do this for home sales and for rentals too, because yeah, you know, rentals I, are really I, important. I think so. it's an absolutely fabulous yeah. idea. Okay, so I guess one of the other, uh, we got about 15 minutes left. Um, one of the other 
um, issues that's been on the table for uh, eWeb for a while is, of course, the smart meter thing. Any thoughts on that? Yeah, so I mean, I, I think smart meters have some good things to provide. So if you're looking at being able to route power to the most needed places like hospitals during an emergency. Uh, so you just shut everybody else off. Well, the number that you need to in order to make sure that you're providing the power necessary for the most critical mm -hmm. facilities. Because yeah. if you don't shut off some people, then no one's going to have power because you're going to have rolling brownouts. So, you know, it's hard decisions have to be made sometimes, and smart meters is one way that you can deal with emergency situations by pow routing power to the most needed places. Okay. Uh, a second, you know, positive is that if you actually do want to lower your power bills is that it allows eWeb to offer time of use pricing where you mm -hmm. can actually buy, kind of try and tra switch your use to when power is cheapest. So generally at night when there's lots of hydropower and nobody's using it as opposed to during the day when everyone's using their power. Well, the real, the real, so, the real thing that you, you <coughs> want to do is uh, base load in the sense of just, of just leveling the load because those are the plants that, that run at the highest efficiency, the larger um, high temperature because you are, as a physics major, you're probably familiar with the Carnot cycle, which is a limitation on how much energy you can get out of a heat system. Mm -hmm. And so um, the higher the, the temperature differential between your high temperature reservoir and your low temperature reservoir measured against absolute temperature, which is, you know, absolute mm -hmm. zero, right. gives you a very simple limitation on the overall efficiency for uh, converting your, your power or converting. Well, I mean, I, but I mean, yeah. going, going back, I think yeah. <clears throat> uh, the point is, is that sometime there's lots, sometimes there's lots of power and people, yep. not very many people using it and other power time. is cheap to go out and buy on the wholesale markets. And there's other times where uh, there's not a lot of power and everybody's yep. using it and power is more expensive. Mm -hmm. But when you get your power bill, it's all the same price all the time, no matter when you turn it on. And what this is saying is that, well, if you're someone we that's willing to fix that, yeah. you know, move your use a little bit to earlier, later in the day when less people yeah. are using, that eWeb will actually lower your rates accordingly based mm -hmm. upon what the power actually costs at that time. And that's a way for you to save money. Yeah. Uh, so well, that, that I, I think that there's positive benefits. And uh, unfortunately, uh, I think that uh, eWeb and others have not done a good job communicating on what you know, actual health risks are associated with the products. Well, what they did was they went up against a, a bunch of people um, who didn't have a really good understanding of the science and applied a moral approach to it and, uh, and created a fair amount of opposition where maybe the, the numbers and information that they were putting out wasn't actually verifiable, mm. but a lot of people believed it. So it gets you into the whole postmodernist thing where if we feel that something is true, then it's true, regardless of whether the physical evidence supports it or not. Well, I, I think yeah. we've seen the eWeb, uh, other local entities, LTD, mm -hmm. the yeah. city. Uh, public process is something that, unfortunately, local government has not been very good at. And it's something that I hope uh, to make eWeb better at. Okay. Uh, you know, there's really little things that eWeb can do, like recording its board meetings online for a start. I've been pushing them in that direction. They're yeah. going to start putting all their audio recordings online next month uh, because of that, some of that work. Uh, there's doing listening sessions all around the community so we can hopefully reach out to some folks that aren't mm -hmm. getting listened to regularly. Yeah. Uh, <clears throat> and, you know, and then there's just also not signing secret contracts. Uh, that are unavailable to the public, even through public records requests. So, right, uh, that that's a that's a separate set of problems, a management problem. But what about what about, for example, putting together some talks about the actual economics and physics of power? Mm -hmm. I mean, one of the things you know, I started to allude to this a couple times in the conversation, is there's a lot of people that I know. For example, take this studio here. Mm -hmm. um, when the studio gets open, there's a whole bunch of lights out there, fluorescent lights in the outside, and there's, I think, eight switches to it. Um, there are some people who claim to be good environmentalists, and yet they will walk in and turn every one of the switches on and leave them on. Mm -hmm. Okay? Do they need to do that? They uh, leave the bathroom, they don't turn the light off. Okay? At the same time that they are lecturing other people about the need to deal with climate change and other things, mm -hmm. they are not shutting off lights that are unnecessary. 
right? right? It's the so Al Gore problem, right? It's the what? Al Gore problem. Uh, well, I'm not. So, I'm, you don't well, have look, to specifically bring this, him up. I mean, but yeah. Well, I mean, look. The, yeah. It's 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 two things, right? Yep. It's it's individual choices. It's absolutely but it's, individual choices. It's also systems change, right? Yep. I mean, right now we live in a in a system where mm -hmm. it's very easy to buy a car, get gas, drive, and get to where you need to go. Like that's yep. what our system has been designed for, yep. and that's what's been made easiest. And so, you know, when you start talking about you know how do we slowly transition you know systems over time, it's about making it so that the easy decision for individuals to make is the right decision, and not putting the bad decision right in front of them and advertising it, uh, saying this is yes. what you want. Mm -hmm. uh, so. You know, I, I just want to say that you know, while individual actions are important and everyone should be doing their you know, little piece in their own lives, there's also the fact that we have uh, uh, systems in place where there are extremely powerful players that spend hundreds of millions of dollars mm -hmm. trying to affect change and make it so that the system is uh, one that pushes you towards fossil fuel use. Yep. And if we're going to change those systems so that instead of getting pushed towards fossil fuel use, you get pushed towards a different option, we're going to need to build the power to change those systems and affect you know political dynamics, and you know this UWEB seat is one you know small piece of that. But uh, you know at the at the federal level, you know we're going to need to have people that believe in science, believe and and want to enact policies from their own perspective yeah. that deal with it, mm -hmm. and so that ideally we're arguing about policies and not arguing about facts. The, the, the basic premise well, of we whether always, something we is... We should always be arguing about facts and we should be attempting to make sure that our facts are actually facts and mm -hmm. not just some ideological position that we feel is true. Right. That's what I was... The point that I was trying to yeah. make is that okay. ideally, ideally we can agree on what the actual numbers and facts are and not say, well, that's just, you know, fake news. Well, unfortunately today, people don't seem to be able to get to that point. You know, yeah. there's a lot of stuff where... Um, the the narratives are are definitely in conflict with the observable physical evidence mm -hmm. and also um, we have a lot of a lot of this kind of uh, if you if you understand the physics you understand how these systems are constrained and so there's a lot of folks who do not understand that science who say oh well we can just throw up a few solar panels and everything will be good and they're the government or whatever you want to, you know, whatever the enemy is, is keeping us from this true path and or Tesla. One of the ones that really drives me nuts is the whole Nikolai Tesla who solved all of our problems and therefore what you have to do is to go back and figure out what he did because he got it right and everybody else, you know, who's worked on this problem is wrong. Um, and they, they killed him for that and I, I get that a lot, uh, you know, when you start talking mm -hmm. about energy and the physics around energy. Um, so yeah, how you know, it's good that it's good that you're pushing this, and I, I'm encouraged to you know hear you say this kind of stuff. But you're going to run up against a lot of that, and if you haven't yet, you're going to you know even more in the future. Mm -hmm. Well, I, I hope that by uh, yeah. being open-minded, mm -hmm. by doing good research, and be, by kind of bringing good ideas to the table, and working with my fellow commissioners mm -hmm. to uh, develop ideas that we think yeah. will work for the community, that we're going to be able to move the ball forward on. You know, both not you know not only clean energy, but on uh, affordability issues, trying to make it so that uh, some of our our rate structures for uh, low-income individuals are a little fairer. Uh, working on uh, public safety resiliency, basically emergency preparedness. Uh, so mm -hmm. you know, expanding our work with local schools to have water distribution sites uh, located throughout the community. So after say a major earthquake, that we would have those sites available. Uh, trying to partner with, say, uh, U Eugene and Food for Lane County to try and maybe have a parallel food distribution to go with that so that as a community we're preparing and not just leaving it all to individuals because yeah, a, a lot of individuals will not issue. make the right choice and have three to six weeks of food, the, the recommended actually six weeks of food that we have uh, in case of a major earthquake here. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, I think there are these things where we need to really deal with these things at a kind of a higher level. Yeah. and not just leave it to individuals because uh, a lot of it's hard right and there's some things that you can do better as a group as a community than saying well it's all on everyone individually to uh, I, I would agree out. with that I mean the uh, number is that the, if, if we had a major emergency the the shopping or the 
grocery store shelves would, would mm -hmm. deplete in about two days. Right. Because and we're doing just-in-time inventory for um, these systems, so you, you reduce your capital carrying costs. Right. And so, I mean, ideally, we would have, be able to do something where the city of Eugene and Food for Link County would, and, uh, could mm -hmm. kind of pair up and have a, a food storage system where after every so often the excess food is getting donated as it's uh, before it expires. Right. Uh, and, you know, similar uh, other stuff on public safety is, you know, working with emergency services to make sure that they have solar yeah. and battery backup power mm -hmm. so that they can keep services operating even if we have major roads or power lines go down. And, you know, I think an idea would be to get to the point where we have you know a house on every street that has battery backup power and solar so that you know at a minimum hopefully one of your neighbors can help you out if we have uh, you know a true catastrophe like that mm -hmm. and you know just hardening the infrastructure for blackouts as well just we've been getting these ice storms every few years and I think that's really important as well right yeah okay so we got about three more minutes mm -hmm. um, and uh, I'm sort of you know just a suggestion uh, you mentioned uh, James Hansen and a couple other people. Mm -hmm. um, I would suggest you read some stuff by James Lovelock, mm -hmm. okay, who was, he's still, I think he's still alive, he's in his 90s, but as um, considered to be probably the foremost atmospheric scientist, um, mm -hmm. you know, probably still on the planet. Um, and what he has to say about the tipping point in climate change and the like, and you might find that to be a little bit, a little bit interesting. Um, I think a lot of the ideas that you got are good. Um, I encourage you to keep, you know, running that stuff down, but and and pushing it. I think it's a good progressive voice that uh, probably needs to be on the on the eWeb board. But you're, uh, yeah. So. Any, anything you want to add? I mean, on your well, campaign, what are you doing you know, for your campaign? Uh, well, I mean, first, I just want to say, you know, thank you so yeah. much for having me yeah. here. I really, really appreciate the opportunity. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, I, I think in terms of, you know, why folks should, should vote for me is you know, I have a proven track record of experience uh, passing clean energy policies. So from mm -hmm. when I was in community college, helped switch my community college to uh, wind energy at uh, University of Oregon. I founded Divest UO, which pushed the found University of Oregon Foundation to say that they would no longer invest in fossil fuels. Uh, mm -hmm. Worked on the campaigns, gathering thousands of petitions to get the city to pass its climate recovery ordinance, and later did a bunch of the research that led to the city adopting its science-based greenhouse gas reduction targets. Uh, as a sustainability commissioner, I developed the home energy score policy, which is about to be worked on by council. There's also facilitated the drafting of a tiny home uh, policy and mm -hmm. a uh, electric vehicle home policy, where new homes would have the wiring for electric vehicle charging stations that's about mm -hmm. to be worked on by council. And I'm a lobbyist for the clean energy jobs bill, so help take that policy from uh, at the state legislature, one that would cap greenhouse gas emissions, and help take that from uh, just an idea to basically one of the big priorities for next year. I uh, was the chairing, uh, steering committee ch uh, chair mm -hmm. for that coalition uh, in 2016. And so uh, just done a lot of work pushing on clean energy. Uh, it's something that I've been yeah. successful at, something that I think that eWeb is well poised to do and that I have the background and experience to really mm -hmm. make a difference there. Yeah. Uh, we've, uh, in terms of the, you asked about the campaign, we've knocked uh, a few thousand doors, hopefully oh, uh, so uh, double that number. You're really going, and, going uh, for it. Huh? You know, we're, we're doing what we can and so uh, talking as many, uh, yes I do, uh, it's Zach, Z-A-C-H. Uh, for the number four eweb e w e b dot o r g, okay. uh, please visit there. Uh, same Facebook slash Zach for eweb. And uh, anyways, I'd love folks' support, and I really appreciate the time. Uh, thank yeah. you for so much for having me here today. Yeah, it's been it's been a pleasure, been a good conversation. So, um, yeah, I want to thank the folks for for watching, um, and we will be back with yet another candidate. Um, you, I think, are number thirteen in the list of ones that we've done and uh, we still have about that many to go All right. before we run out. So thank you very much and good luck on your campaign. Thank you.